page number 426, page 426, dwelling in Beulah land. <clears throat> On the second verse, turn around and greet someone this, this morning, for page 426.
far away the noise of strife upon my ear is falling. Then I know the sins of earth beset on every hand. Nouts and fear and things of earth in vain to me are calling. None of these shall move me from land. I'm living on the mountain underneath the cloudless sky. I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply, for I am dwelling in land. Turn around and greet someone this morning. The kids' classes will remain upstairs this morning. The, the older two classes upstairs, the three- and four-year-olds are going downstairs. So all the other kids need to remain in the auditorium this morning. Y'all go ahead and shake your hands. On the last viewing here the works of God I sing in contemplation. Hearing now his blessed voice, I see the way he planned. Dwelling in the Spirit here I learn a full salvation. Gladly will I tarry in Land. I'm living on the mountain underneath the cloudless sky. I'm drinking at the fountain that never shall run dry. Oh yes, I'm feasting on the manna from a bountiful supply for I am dwelling in beautiful land.
right, you may be seated for just a few minutes, and uh, we are uh, going to receive our offering. Gentlemen, come on and get, get his offering plates down here. We'll go ahead and, and get ready for that. Um, I just I was getting ready to announce that if you're watching at home, send me a text and let me know. We'd love to know that you're watching at home. And then my cell phone number is area code 734-255-3650. Uh, send me that text message. Tell me where you're watching from. But I was smiling as I'm saying this because I was getting ready to make that announcement. And I looked down and I got a message from Brother Jenkins. And Brother Dave Jenkins says, Brother Jenkins watching live 1,122 miles south of the North Pole. Where is he at, Miss Jenkins? Borrow, Alaska. That's a long ways. <laughs> That's a long way. So, it, in this day we live in is crazy for a lot of different reasons, isn't it? I'm come a little country church is having service here and someone that far away is watching live. That's absolutely incredible. Oh, Brother Jenkins, have a good trip and um, stay warm. I don't even know what temperature it is there. It's probably kind of warm right now, but I'm glad that he's able to watch from where he is. He travels not real often, but he, three or four times a year he has to leave and uh, go out of country, but uh, we hope he comes back quickly and safely. All right, got a couple of announcements we need to make this morning. And um, uh, some of these, I don't have all of the details, and so you'll need to see the people responsible for, um, for those uh, announcements. So one of those is TFM, uh, Thruly Furnished Ministry Students, this Saturday, we need your help returning the pop cans that were donated for your missions trip. We, uh, I think it was a cruel trick by the Lord, possibly, that we had started collecting all of those cans to, uh, as a fundraiser for our Cuba missions trip. And just a few weeks after we started, everything got shut down, including the pop bottle returns. We have got a mountain of cans in the barn. You can't even walk through the barn because they're piled so high. There are hundreds of cans to be returned, and we've got to reclaim our space. So we need your help this Saturday returning all of those pop cans. And I'm, I can't wait to hear how much money's worth is out there. That's, we're going to find out just how unhealthy Americans are, so it's gonna, what's, what's going to happen. But um, 10 cents a can goes a long ways. So we need some help. It's at 9 a.m. this Saturday. If you're in Thruly Furnished Ministries, we need you to be here. And then Brother Stephen said he needs some adults to help as well. And we're going to have to make a couple of trips to go return these things. I don't know how all that will work. And uh, thankfully, I'm not available Saturday, so I won't know from experience but I'll hear the stories, I'm sure. All right, so that's this Saturday at 9. See Brother Stephen, if you have questions about that or if you're able to help run the cans back and forth, I don't know how all that's gonna work. See Brother Stephen and let him know that you can help. And then Miss Jenkins heads up our, um, our missions closet. And uh, we, it's full of very nice things that we, we try to help our missionaries with as they come through, uh, all, all kinds of stuff. And we've done a couple different um, not, not fundraisers, but uh, projects to help the, the missions closet. And anytime there's a, a need that Miss Jenkins can think of that we could help with as a church, she lets me know. And right now is one of those times. We have collected a lot of the travel size toiletries, shampoo, soap, toothpaste, those kinds of things. And we have really more than we need right now. And um, she's been in contact with Brother Joe Hicks, who has the street work down in Detroit. And we're going to put together a bunch of care packages um, for, for Brother Hicks and for his ministry, those that he ministers to down in Detroit. And so we need some very specific items. Don't just go clear your... Go, I know Baptists are, are frugal people. Uh, we, we view anything that's in a hotel room as a, as a freebie sample type thing. So every one of you has got suitcases full of travel size stuff. Don't just go empty all that. Okay, that's not what we're asking for. Miss, Miss Jenkins has some things she's looking for. And maybe you just want to contribute some money to it instead of having to go shop for it or bring it in. You need to see Miss Jenkins. Miss Jenkins, raise your hand. That's Miss Jenkins. She will answer all of the questions you have. Don't come ask me. I've just told you everything I know about it, okay? So I don't have any other answers. She's the one you want to talk to and about time frames and all of that. And uh, let's get that going as quickly as we can, but let's do it right as well, okay? And then uh, the last two announcements is the first, the first class of the fall trimester for um, Thruly Furnished Ministries starts uh, the second Sunday of September, all right? So not next week, but the following week, and so we need to get everything. If you're planning on taking those classes, you need to register, get your registration forms in so we can get all of that situated. We need to know how many, how, many, how many students to prepare for and all of that, so you need to get that in this week to Brother Stephen or myself and uh, so we know how to plan. And then the last announcement this morning is the last 
the last Sunday of September, September 26th. I'm going to say this over and over again over the next few weeks because I want you to remember it. It's a very, very important Sunday, September 26th. The service will start at 1030 in the morning. There'll be no 10 o'clock hour. The service will start at 1030. And I, I kind of rolled out our, um, our Zonka language ambition and, and goals for that translation project. I rolled that out back in uh, last Sunday of February. And um, due to the shutdown and lots of different things going on, we haven't been able to say a whole lot about that. But that Sunday will be our formal adoption service for that language. Now, if you're newer to Faith Baptist Church, you have no idea what I'm talking about. And that's, here's what I want you to do. I want you to plan on being here on that day. I'll give you lots of information. I'll tell you where we are with the project and with some funds that have already come in. I'll give you a full report. I've got some special guests that are going to be with us to help me relay some of this information to you. And so I want you to be here to be a part of it. We are going to officially sign the adoption certificate for the Zonka language. And I want everyone in attendance who's going to partner with us to sign that thing. We're going to post it on the wall as a reminder of our commitment. And over the next few years, I, am, I can't tell you how excited I am to see how the Lord is going to use this church to get the Bible into that language. So we'll say more about that. But just remember that on September 26th, that Sunday morning, the service will start at 1030. And uh, we'll have that special service there. Uh, who, uh, two people waving at me. Brother Humbrock. That's what it is. I'm sorry. The 26th, I have another event on the 26th. That's why I keep saying that. Is that what you're going to say, Miss Dean Hoffer? Man, correcting me publicly. <laughs> thank you, because everybody would have been completely confused. So thank you for that. All right, the 27th is the Sunday, 26th is the Saturday. Don't be here at 1030 on the 26th. You'll be alone. All right, so come on the 27th at 1030. All right, Brother Bob, how about asking the blessing on the offering this morning, please, sir? Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the privilege we have to gather together this morning to praise and worship you thankful for your love, your goodness to us. Lord, I want to hold up before you a man in California who pastors a large church there. I forgot his name. Mrs. Hayes gave it to me this morning, and you know who he is. They've told him that if he opens his church this morning, he'll be arrested, and he's going to open. So I ask that your will be done. You protect him, him and his congregation, Lord. Might they be May they show you the love of, may they show the love of God to the surrounding area. Also, Lord, we thank you for the Sunday school hour this morning. I was reminded that everything I have belongs to you, everything. The, so thank you for the opportunity to give back a portion of what you've entrusted to us. For I ask these things in Jesus' precious name, amen.
Thank you, Miss Laura. It was beautiful music this morning. Take your Bibles, please. I need you to find two places in your Bibles with me. I've asked Brother Dowdy and Miss Laura to stay on the platform for a little while because I need their help in just a little bit. Um, And then what I'd like to do right now is bow our heads together one more time and ask the Lord's help this morning. I certainly need it, and uh, you're going to need it as well as we try to study His Word. Father, we come before you one more time, and, and God, I I am fully aware of my inability and my weaknesses this morning. And so, God, I, I ask you in the name of Jesus to please make my mind sharp. Lord, would you please help me be able to recall those things that I need. And, Lord, none of this is for my glory or, your, or for me. Lord, it's for you. God, please speak to our hearts and change us in some way. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Find two places in your Bible, the book of 1 Peter chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 1. The book of 1 Peter chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 1. These two passages we will use in the very beginning this morning. I do not have a single, that is only one text that we'll be using, but we will be using a lot of our Bible this morning. So if you're not familiar with Faith Baptist Church, when you leave here today, one thing you will know for sure is that we like to use our Bibles. Uh, I, I have a lot of things I'd like to say, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother anybody in a service like this with my own thoughts. However, we have the entire Word of God in front of us, and it's full of things that we all need to hear. And so uh, find those two places with me in your Bible. I have before me a, a, an enormous topic, and I'll just be honest with you, I've spent the last three years studying the topic this morning. And uh, when I say the last three years, I don't mean reading a, a book three years ago and then finally deciding to preach on it. I have got book after book after book in my office on this topic. I have scoured my Bible with looking for pertinent uh, and in-context uh, verses and passages referring to and talking about the topic this morning. I have tried to, uh, I, I've tried my best over the last, uh, last few years to, to look at different areas of my life and take special note of the topic for this morning. And so, I, I've, honestly, I've had this sermon in my, in my file ready to preach for the last eight months, and a couple of times I really thought we'd be ready for it, and, and the Lord just led me to a different place. But this morning, here's where we find ourselves. It's a strange Sunday morning message. I know that. I don't have to come to me later and tell me that. I know that, Okay. But it's a very, very important, and it's a huge, it's a huge topic. And so I I want you to follow me the best that you can. This morning, we're going to look at the topic of morality. Morality. More specifically, we're going to look at the topic of the morality of music. The morality of music. Now, this is so very important, and here's, here's why it's important. We're going to find that by the end of this sermon, by the end of this service, you're going to leave this place, hopefully, with a, a better awareness of how music impacts our lives, not on a daily basis, more like on an hourly basis, and in most of our cases, by the minute. Now, that's a big statement. I'll give you some statistics along the way. I'll give you some information along the way that'll help you understand why I say all of that. But here's, look, look, whether you're here and you're Baptist or whether you're here and you don't have any church affiliation whatsoever, I'm telling you what I will tell you this morning from the youngest child in here to the oldest adult, it has the, it has the ability to change your earthly life. But for those Christians who sincerely desire to serve God and please him, it'll change your spiritual life. It will. Let's talk about the morality of music. I think the first place we need to start is with a couple of definitions. I like dictionaries. I have several in my office. I use them as much as I do any other book besides the Bible. I'm being honest with you. I have dictionary apps on my phone and my tablet. I like definitions. It helps me know that what I'm saying is what's intended. Let's look, at the, let's look at the Oxford English Dictionary, the definition of morale. Now, there is, or moral rather, there is several definitions. There are, I believe there are over a dozen definitions for the word moral in the Oxford English Dictionary. But here's the definition we're going to use. This is the one that best suits, best fits, the, I believe, what is the Bible definition of morality or moral. Here's what it means. Of or pertaining to character or disposition as considered good or bad virtuous or vicious, 
of or pertaining to the distinction between right or wrong or good and evil in relation to the actions, volitions, or character of responsible beings. So, so here, here, here's what this says. Now, the next definition is even longer. Just prepare your minds now. It's even longer, but it's even better. But what we just read is that moral or morality refers to the determination of whether actions are good or bad. Those things which are deemed to be good are moral. Those things which are deemed to be bad or evil are immoral. All right, that's the definition. Now, the Oxford English Dictionary is the furthest thing from a Christian dictionary. It's about as secular as you can get, and yet that's the definition you find in the Oxford English Dictionary. My favorite dictionary is the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. You find things in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary that you don't find in any other dictionary. Now, while it is true that if you get a full edition of the Oxford English Dictionary, they give you the, the, the etymology and the, the full history of the word and its usage, and it gives, sometimes you'll find a Bible verse in there and it gives the, the, the time period of the 1600s, 1500s. But, the, but the, uh, the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, listen to this definition. Here's what you find, and then you find Bible verses next to it in the dictionary, by the way. Here's what it says. The quality of an action which renders it good, uh, the conformity of an act to the divine law, special attention to that, those two words, divine law, or to, be the, or, or to the principles of rectitude. This conformity implies that the, the act must be performed by a free agent and from a motive of obedience to the divine will. Careful attention to the two words, divine will. This is the strict theological and scriptural sense of morality. But we often apply the word to actions which, uh, which accord with justice and human laws without reference to the motives from which they proceed. So here it is again. Morality is the determination that something is good or bad. According to the first part of that definition, not according to what I want or what you want, but according to the divine will and divine law. All right, so as we, as we think of this this morning, we're going to uh, now, if, you're, if I'm your pastor and you've known me a long time, you know that in my head things sound and look totally different. And when I usually try to explain something, it's a mess. I know that. Help me this morning. Just, just try to follow me the best you can. I'm going to try to explain the morality of music to you the best I can. But before we do that, we need, to, we need to look at what the Bible says about morality in general. Now, you're in, you're in 1 Peter chapter 1. Look at verse 16. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 says this, Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. All right, so what we find in this verse is a very clear distinction in the word of God between that which is holy and that which is unholy. He says, I want you to be holy. Now listen, if it was only possible to be holy, there would be no need for that verse in the Bible. We would just be, and we would naturally be holy. But the fact that we're commanded to be holy implies that there's this possibility and maybe even natural tendency to be unholy. We could say it this way. Be moral, for I am moral. Okay. Okay. In other words, we could say don't be immoral. All of those statements are accurate. If you're with me, say Amen. All right, Ephesians chapter 1. It says it a little bit differently here. Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. That's the church. All right? We are in, we are in Christ. Before the foundation of the world, God already decided that all those that would be in Christ, he chose us for something. What did he choose us for? Look what it says. That we should be, say it together, holy. Say it one more time. Holy. holy. There it is again. All right, so he's chosen us in Christ to be holy. Look at the rest of the verse. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. In other words, the Bible says over in 1 Peter that God is holy, so we should be holy. Well, we need a little more explanation. Well, then Ephesians says that before the foundation of the world, God already decided that those who would trust Jesus Christ as their Savior, those who would be found in Christ, would be holy. So we can say it this way. Those that are in Christ should be moral. It's okay to say amen. 
even if it's about something that convicts you. Amen simply means, preacher, I agree with you. And I'm going to tell you this morning, I could sure use an amen or two. We're called to be holy people. That is right people, not according to men, but according to God. So we're commanded to be moral people. As we look at this topic of morality, we're going to try to break it down into three different areas. We, we find support for this in Scripture. I'll give you some of these references. This first part, I've got to move quick, okay? So jot these down. I'll read these to you. We won't turn to all these places. I've got them in my notes. You don't have that luxury, so just follow me the best you can, all right? We find in our Bible that there are three areas of our lives that, are, that, that, that uh, morality uh, is drawn from. Right, the ability to be right is drawn from these three areas. If the ability to be right or to do right is drawn from these three areas, then we also find that the ability to be wrong is also found in every one of these areas. Are you with me? All right. The first area is going to be the heart. The heart. Our heart is where our emotions come from. It's where they, it all begins right there. We, we say things all the time like, I love you with all my heart or I have a broken heart. What we're saying is my emotions are affected by something. So we find in scripture that our heart has the ability to be moral or immoral. Let me give you a couple of examples very, very quickly. In 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 9, the Bible says, And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel. All right, so something inside of Solomon was no longer in love with his Savior, no longer yearned for his, for his God, rather. His heart had turned from God. We find in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, it says, For godly sorrow worketh uh, repentance to salvation. In other words, there's a sorrow of the heart. That's an emotion of the heart that is moral. It is good. It has a, a good effect, a good working. Did you know there's also a sorrow of the heart that's immoral? It, when people lose money many times, they're just as brokenhearted. Which is why the Bible says the love of money. The love of money. That's the heart is the root of all evil. You, you understand, we, we find that morality affects the heart. I'll give you a couple more of these references. We find in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 16, and thou shalt consume all the people which the Lord thy God shall deliver thee. And right there, the world we live in says God is such a hateful and unjust and a, and a mean God because he told these people to go in and consume, that is, wipe out the inhabitants of that land. What is, that, what, what is taking place when someone says God's unfair for that is they're trying to make God like them yeah. instead of trying to make them like God. God is completely holy. His sense of justice and purity and right is, is perfect in every way. Amen. So God tells the people, you're going to go into the land and you're going to consume them. You're going to get rid of them. Listen to what he says. Matter of the heart. Thine eye shall have no pity upon them. In other words... Your heart should be moral when you look on the inhabitants of that land. They're wicked, they're killing their babies and their, their children, they're offering sacrifices, they're waging unjust wars. When you look at them, don't let your heart have pity for them. Be moral in your heart. We find examples all the way through, and we, could, we don't have time to look at all this, but, but you understand there's lots of references that talk about the heart of man being right or wrong and, and all of those things. The second part, the second part of morality is our mind. Now, I've tried to arrange this order, and, and there's just this process, this progression, and it's, these first two can sometimes be, be flipped, but I believe for the most part, this is the way it goes. You, you begin with something in your heart, and eventually it's in your mind. Your heart feels something, your heart loves something or hates something, and eventually your mind begins to imagine and think about whatever your heart is feeling. Okay, this is a... Hey, if I was not a preacher, if I was standing in some classroom with a bunch of degrees behind my name, people would go, oh, that's so profound. It's true, okay? What I'm saying is true. That's why it's so important to teach our children to get to know somebody before they start loving somebody. Because your heart does not care about the facts. Thank you, Pastor Summers. You're welcome, Pastor Summers. 
This is what the Bible says in Genesis chapter six. That God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. His heart was one way and it made the imaginations and the thoughts follow suit. In fact, so much so that God looked at man on, on the earth and said they're an immoral bunch. They're a wicked bunch. It's the mind. There's a morality about our minds. That is, what we think about is either right or wrong. And hey, look right here. There is no gray area. There's no gray area. It's either right or wrong. It's either moral or immoral. Are we okay this morning? Everyone okay? All right, you're getting quiet. A couple more examples. Psalm 10, verse 10 Psalm 10, verse 4, rather. The wicked through his pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. You know why God's not in all his thoughts? Because God's not in his heart. His, his thoughts are, are wicked. They're immoral because his heart doesn't love God. There's several references we can look at. I think you get the idea. In the third part, after we've talked about our heart and our mind, then we get to our actions. Our actions. Everybody say, my actions. actions. All right. Your actions are yours. They're not mine. I'll not answer for your actions. Your choices are yours. You will think about what you do, and you will either decide this is a wise choice or an unwise choice. And many times, even acknowledging that it's an unwise choice, we will make the decision to do it anyway. Your decisions, not mine. However... I believe that I can have an effect on your actions. The way I talk can affect your actions. Nobody in Chelsea would come to Faith Baptist Church in Chelsea to hear me preach if I talk like this all the time and say, turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to look at creation this morning. Seven days of creation, God created all things. <laughs> would you come back? Hold on. The way I talk, the things I say, the things I talk about can impact you. The things I wear, the things I listen to can affect you. But at the end of the day, it's still your behavior. We live in a day where people blame everybody else for all their issues. No, that's your decisions, They're your, your actions. Let's talk about our behavior. Very, very, I don't need to spend much time on this. You know that our behavior is right or wrong. That's the most visible form of morality. Morality exudes from our behavior so clearly that we don't even need to talk about it a whole lot. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Okay, what he's saying is the way you live, the things you do should be holy. They should be moral. That's what we're talking about. All right, so those are the three areas. Now let's make the application to music. Let's talk about the three areas of morality in music. I've just shown you from Scripture, and we could spend an entire service just looking at those three areas and how the Bible proves that those are either moral or immoral in your life. Now let's, let's focus the lens even further down and look at just music, just music. How many of you, by show of hands, would say, Preacher, this week I listened to one song? Okay, if you don't have your hands up, it means you didn't even realize you did it. Because you can't even pump gas at a gas station anymore without hearing music. You can't walk into any store without hearing music. You can't call for technical support without hearing music. All, you can only hope it's in your language. That's the only thing you can hope at that point. I'm, I'm just saying music is everywhere. It's everywhere. Let's talk about how music can be moral or immoral. First of all, let's talk about the morality of music as it pertains to our heart. I still believe that what we put in our heart 
is going to dictate what we think about and what we do. I still believe that. I believe that we must look at the morality of the heart um, when it comes to music because I, I, I truly believe that's where it all starts. Now let's, let's talk about this. The music can make you feel. There's the, that emotion. It makes you feel differently. I've already proven to you from Scripture that God views feelings as either moral or immoral. The way you love or hate, the way that you are joyful or sad, God says it's either moral or immoral. So if music makes you feel a certain way, then music must be moral or immoral. Do you understand that? The Bible admits this. In fact, the people in Scripture admitted this. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, the most obvious example of this, though there are many examples of it, the most obvious is found right here in 1 Samuel. You'll know the story. Let me read the passage to you. 1 Samuel 16 verse 23 says this, And it came to pass when the evil spirit, lowercase, evil spirit from God was upon Saul. That means he had a bad mood. God calls an evil spirit. That is, evil does not mean sinful in the Bible all the time. Sometimes it means tumultuous, uh, uh, calamitous. It means means violent or or just bad. So here it is. King Saul was in a bad mood, and God caused him to be so because he wasn't a good king. He disobeyed. So the Bible says when there was this bad mood, this evil spirit came upon Saul, and David took a harp and played with his hand, So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Here's what we just read. We just read that King Saul would find himself in what Charles Spurgeon would call a melancholy or a a depression. And he would say, you know what I need? I need some uplifting music. Go get David. David would come in and play with a harp. The Bible says it made Saul well, made him better. Music affects the way you feel. It's important that we see this. I'm I'm gonna use a stupid, a stupid illustration for you. Ms. Laura, what key was that I gave you earlier? I didn't see. All right, you all know the wedding march, right? The happy, I don't, there, there, technically there's not words to it, but we all know it as here comes the bride, here comes the bride. You, okay, maybe not. It's a happy song. I won't be able to play it the way it's written. Right? we go well what if i what if i change that just a little bit because music makes you feel something how would you like it if your wedding day was remembered like this (laughs) some of you do remember your wedding day that way i guess It works with any song, really. Over the last few years, I've messed around with this. It's hilarious, some of the results you get. How about... Um, right the song? Do you know that song? Maybe you don't. How about this? Okay, I think you get it. How about Mary Had a Little Lamb? Mary Had a Little Lamb goes from being a happy kid song, right, to a horror song about a psychotic lamb chasing Mary. kids party song, isn't it? You understand difference, the difference that music makes on our hearts. 
Now, all I did was go from playing it in the major key it's written into playing it in a relative minor key. Changing one note makes all the difference. It makes us feel different. Enter the morality of music. Miss Laura, get ready to play that song. Here's what I can do. I gave Miss Laura this simple arrangement of the wedding march earlier. If, if she was to sit down and play this song for the offertory this morning, as soon as she hit the third note, everyone would be going, what is she doing? <laughs> or can you imagine? Get ready. I'm going to point to you when it's ready, okay? Can you imagine coming into the church auditorium for a funeral? The loved ones have lost this dear, dear one to them, and they're sorrowing and they're grieving. And the service is ready to start, and then all of a sudden, hit it, Miss Laura. She go for it, hit it, Miss Laura. <laughs> Everyone's gonna think that Miss Laura got her schedule mixed up, and she came for a wedding instead of a funeral, right? However, so hold on a second, Miss Laura. However, every one of us. That's like one of the, the biggest parts of the wedding ceremony, right? Everyone's come in. The ushers have made a mess of everything. Families are all mixed up. This way it always goes. They put uh, as flower arrangements on the end of the pews, which are all knocked over by the time the thing, the thing starts. And, and everything is set up. They got their salt covenant and their lamp candles, whatever it might be. Everyone's kind of talking, kind of hushed all of a sudden. The same auditorium they were yelling in Sunday, but now it's a wedding. And so it's time to be quiet. And all of a sudden, it's time. And all at once, hit it, Ms. Laura, instantly, in everyone's mind, they know here comes the bride. Just like that. All right, thank you, Ms. Laura. You understand the power of music. The power of music. Now, I've just used all wholesome, I think Mary Had a Little Lamb was wholesome, examples. But did you know that the world is not very good the lost world is not very good at creating godly music. But they are masters at creating music that speaks a different message to the heart. I believe that the morality of music begins at the heart, though it is not limited to the heart. Hey, Brother Stephen, you got that soundtrack ready to go? I want you to listen to this. I want you to listen to how this feels. I, I like classical music, and it's not for everybody, I get it. Um, but I, I liked the way it, certain principles are so clearly illustrated. I was listening to the music, it wasn't this, this song, but I, I forget what it was I was listening to, but Melody was in the other room, and I had it playing, I was studying, and all at once from the other room she yelled in, I can't take it! <laughs> now, it wasn't a, a disdain for the music, it was what it was doing to her on the, you'll see what I mean, it was this kind of thing. Brother Stephen, go ahead and play this. It's about a minute long. You feel that? As it's playing, let me talk to you. This is called Revenge, okay? It's a soundtrack for a movie where a, a war general has been betrayed. They think he's dead, but he's returned, as it seems, from the dead. He's going one by one to their houses. He's stalking them. He's seeking revenge. feel it? He's walking up behind somebody right now. You feel that? <laughs> Boom! Use your imagination. Thank you, Brother Stephen. You can figure out what just took place. But did you feel that? Now, what would that scene have been like if it had been to the tune of Row, Row, Row Your Boat? <laughs> it does something. Let me, let me play a chord. You, you'll, some of you will recognize this chord. This chord, you're going to think it's a joke, but it's not. This is the <laughs> minor major seven chord. All right? Tell me if you recognize where this came from. It's the Hitchcock chord. You hear that? That's a C minor major seven. 
and it just does something to you. Alfred Hitchcock was the master of putting together suspenseful movies, but you couple it with suspenseful, uh, suspenseful music, oh, it just, it moves you. What I'm telling you is the Bible says your heart can be moral or immoral. So the way music makes us feel is therefore moral or immoral. I must move along. I have no idea where I put the clarity. Go ahead and advance it to the next slide. Let's talk about the morality of the mind, and this is closely associated and connected to the morality of the heart when it comes to music, but let's talk about this just for a moment. The morality of the mind. Did you know music has the ability to make you an incredible memory? It's amazing. I cannot remember my kids' birthdays. But the right song comes on, and I can tell you where I was the first time I heard it, or I can tell you what I was doing because it means something to me. Couples have their song. You know what I'm talking about? The song we first danced to, or uh, when we were at the um, skating rink and our eyes made contact for the first time, or whatever. You know, the, the song came on. This is our song. My mom and dad's song was Muskrat Love. It's embarrassing. If you've never heard Muskrat Love, I'm not playing it for you this morning, but you should go YouTube that and see what it's all about. What, what, what that means is when they hear those little digital, not even digital, they were electronic Muskrat Love noises, mom and dad instantly begin to get all mushy. Oh, honey, remember back in 1800 when we <laughs> first, first heard that song? God acknowledged the power of music on your mind in Scripture, by the way. Let me read something to you. Exodus chapter 15, verse 1. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord. He hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 19 says, Now therefore write ye this song for you, and teach it, the children of Israel, and in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. Uh, chapter 31, verse 22 says, Moses wrote, therefore wrote this song the same day and taught it the children of Israel. Okay, preachers, so they learned a song. Let me tell you why they learned a song. God said, Moses, I've just delivered you from the Egyptian army. You've watched them be drowned beneath the waves of the sea. The, 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 the corpses and the, all this are washing up on shore. What a striking image. Now, write a song about it, Moses. Write a song about it and teach it to the children. He says, because I want them to remember this day. Hey, we find in the book of Revelation Several thousand years after they wrote the song, God says, the song of Moses is going to be sung. It does something to your mind. It gets it. Come on. Hey, some of, how many of you would say, preacher, I was saved after I was 20 years old? Raise your hand. All right. So I, I'll just pick on you because everyone else, I, I don't know. Whatever. Walking through the grocery store, you can hear... One line, you can hear four notes of a song. And some of you start dancing behind your cart. <laughs> you do. It used to drive me crazy. We would, I'd say one, one word or say a phrase to my brothers or my sisters, and my mom would hear it, and she could sing a song with it. Yeah, I'd say, Jason, get back. And she'd say, hit the road, or get back, Jack. And she'd start singing some song that I've never heard of. I could say, Jason, I hate you, and she would start singing about hate and love. You know why? The morality of the mind. It affects you. Let me read you, an, let me read you a portion of an article. This was, uh, this was written, this was done by the, the BBC back in 2011. This was uh, written by Sonia McGilchrist. And uh, she interviewed lots of, of, of uh, neurologists and um, uh, just uh, lots, lots of different doctors and uh, let, me, let, me, let me finish with, with the last paragraph. I think it's written in a weird order, but let me, so let me finish this for you. This portion, this paragraph is called, What is Dopamine? What is Dopamine? Okay, Here, here's what it says. Dopamine is a common uh, neurotransmitter in the brain. It is released in response to rewarding human activity and is linked to reinforcement and, emo and motivation. These include, listen, these include, here's what produces uh, this dopamine. This includes activities that are biologically significant, such as eating and sex. 
So what, what it's saying is certain, certain things we experience create this, this reward system with chemicals. And dopamine is a, is, a, is a pleasurable thing. It tells your body, oh, this is nice. A lot of people, uh, don't get mad at me, a lot of people experience very similar reactions when eating a good meal. They do. Physical interaction with people, intimacy creates this, this chemical that tells your body, oh, this is nice. It rewards. And so what it ends up doing is it makes your body crave it. Now, this study, this article was written based off of some studies that have been done. Now, let me read you the, this first part of this article. Music releases a chemical in the brain that has a key role in setting good moods, as a study has suggested. The study reported in Nature Neuroscience found that the chemical was, was, was released at moments of peak enjoyment. It goes on down and it says, it is known to produce a good, uh, feel-good state in response to certain tangible stimulants, from eating sweets to taking cocaine. Dopamine is also associated with less tangible stimuli, such as being in love. The report authors say it's significant in improving that humans obtain pleasure from music and abstract reward. And it goes on to talk a little more about it. Look, look, all, all I'm saying is, music has an effect up here. It makes your body feel something. There's a morality of the heart, and it, it, it does it in an effort to lure or reward your body into certain behavior. I read a study, and I, I couldn't quote it for you. I don't know where it is in a book I have in my office. It was found that psychedelic drugs, those, those things that create hallucinations and, and, and those things, they're greatly amplified. The effects are greatly amplified when listening to certain kinds of music with a hard bass beat and lots of sharp high pitches, it makes the experience so much more intense. Music. Music. It's a matter of the mind. It's a matter of the heart. What music is doing to you is either moral or immoral. And let me remind you that you all said amen when I said you're responsible for your own behavior. You're responsible. You're responsible. Let's talk about movies for just a moment. 93% of the time in a movie has music playing. 93%. That means just 7% of that movie is just acting. <laughs> Think about that. If you were to watch any regular movie that you might like at home without any music, it would not affect you the way it does with music. It's, there's subliminal uh, themes throughout, and some, I'm not saying they're all bad and, and immoral, but there are certainly some that way. Sometimes movies will take a song that everyone knows, they know the lyrics to it, and they will pair the song, though the lyrics are not playing, they'll pair the song with a scene in the movie where the lyrics are applicable, because in everyone's mind, that's what's taking place. For instance, they can take a country song that talks about drinking and having a good time at a bar, they can play just the, just the music, no, no lyrics at all. Play just the, the musical score behind the scene. And it makes the scene so much more intense because our minds have retained that. It's a matter of the mind. It's a matter of the heart. And then let's finish with this. After your heart has been affected and after after it's caused emotions that have produced some thoughts. We get to where our imagination has been tainted, marred. And then we begin to act upon what we've already thought about and what we've become emotional about. Then comes our actions.
I just want to. I just want to be clear. I believe that this is rooted in Scripture. It's not just this preacher's opinion. I'm not trying to be mean or hateful. I'm not knocking your music or what you prefer. I'm just telling you what the Bible says music does to us. Let me tell you what the what effect music had on some people in in your Bible. In Exodus chapter 32, you remember the golden calf experience. They didn't just make a golden calf and fall down and worship it. That wasn't good enough. They needed to have a celebration of some sort. So how did they have a celebration? Well, something inside them said, we need some good music. Look, look, look what it says. Exodus 32, verse 18 says this. And he said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh to the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. They were having a party that in order to have the party, they had to have music. And when they had music, it so affected them emotionally. It so affected them in, in mentally that the next move was, I got to dance. It moved them, literally, it moved them. How about when David came back from battle with the Philistines? Remember when he came back into the city? It says the maidens and the young ladies were so overcome with joy at the victory that they were dancing and singing in the streets. It moves you. I was homeschooled. I've never been to a school dance in my life, but I've talked to people that have been. I'll tell you what doesn't happen. When there wants to be a, a close, intimate dance, they don't play a toe tap in tune. Right? They play something slow because they want to move the heart and then move the mind and then move the body. That is a fact. Concerts. Do you ever, I, I overanalyze things. When my wife wants to go shopping, I am perfectly content to drive her to the mall. I will sit in a bench in the middle of the mall happily and just watch. You learn so much by just watching. We've been to some Southern gospel concerts and then to some bluegrass concerts and things. I grew up in South Georgia where it seemed like there was always a group coming through of a concert of some sort. And something always was curious to me. You go into the auditorium, Right? You sit down, and then the music begins to play, and what happens? Lights dim. I remember sitting there thinking to myself, I'm talking about as an 11-year-old boy down in Jessup, Georgia. I remember this thought. Why does it have to be dark in order to listen? Why do we have to have smoke and flashing lights to listen? Because it's not about listening, it's about experiencing. When you get a, a hard bass line, just a boom, 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 boom. There's, there's something in music called anticipation or expectation. Let, let, me, let me give you an example. In music, we, um, when we play a song, we don't just sit down and just play it how, however we want. There's, a, there's, a, there's an order and a pattern and a, a, a purpose to chords and to, mu to music, okay? Every, every key, I'll just say in the key of C, every key has three major chords. You can add more in there, but chords are this. Can you guess where I'm going next? You hear it, it just, goes, it just resolves, all right? Our, our, our human ear, I can play a song in that key and I can use all those chords. And I, you hit that five chord, add the seventh in there, and you just long for it to, to resolve. That's called expectation. All right, that is, that is something inside of us, God created inside of us, where our bodies, though you may be able to play music or you may not be able to play music, your body recognizes the need for that resolution. It creates this tension and then just releases it. It's, it, it's very common that the, that fifth chord is most common. It sounds horrible until you get to, it just resolves back into it. It's, that is music messing with my heart and my mind. Remember that, that tension a while ago of that soundtrack? Someone even covered their ears and said, turn it off. You know why? Because our bodies crave that, that resolution. 
I think it's important, let's, even uh, in, in, our, in our hymn book, something called Cadence. You all know what a cadence is. It's, a lot of the old hymns have amen at the end. You have a full cadence, you have a half cadence, you have a deceptive cadence. Basically, what a cadence is, is a transition. It wants to finish off. So if we do um, uh, whatever song. Um. Then here's the cadence. Some of y'all just felt gypped. Like, wh- what's he doing? I didn't finish the... Right. Uh, some of the most aggravating music is that sometimes it seems like songwriters don't know how to end a song. It's like they get stuck and don't know how to just resolve it. I could drive you nuts. If those of you who have a keen ear to music, I could drive you nuts by doing this. And then just stopping. Because every one of us says, just finish it. I need it to be finished. Do you understand? I just got in your head with a song. Songs are written with a purpose in mind. Onward to Christian soldiers. Look up the words of that song. There's marches and there's different kinds of, of music. I love, I love prayerful worship hymns. My Jesus, I love thee. I just love it. It just flows. It's pretty. You can sing it by yourself in the choir. I love that. But then there's some songs like Onward Christian Soldiers. So uh, I think it's an E flat. I don't, I don't know. Here's the basic rhythm. What's it sound like? A march. Left, 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 right, left, right. So keep, keep hear that the whole time. Hear it? Hear it? However it goes. Hear, hear the whole time? You, you can hear it. Um, um, just sing, sing a bit of that, Brother Dowdy. The Christian soldiers marching as to war With the cross of Jesus before. You apply that to um, Battle Hymn of the Republic. You, you, you hear, you'll hear, the, uh, you hear the, the, the rhythm there. Come, something like that. Hear it? Something like that. So, look, I'm just saying, there are some songs that I prefer on a Sunday morning. I don't want you all to come in and stand and sing the old rugged cross first thing. Maybe, maybe that's carnal of me. It's got a great message. I love the song. But you're going to just kind of mope your way through that on a Sunday morning, on time change especially, those mornings where it's an hour earlier. Look, look I'm just saying, music affects you. It's not just what you're singing. God had acknowledged that music affects our heart, it affects our minds, and in the end, it affects our movements and our actions. Which is why God said, sing to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart. We are musical creatures. God created us to be that way. One of my favorite studies that I read during this last little bit of studying for this thing is um, they were trying to teach, a, to teach a, a chimpanzee to keep rhythm, right? So they taught him to take a stick and bang on a log with the tempo of the song. There was great celebration and joy when they finally got this chimpanzee. As soon as he heard the song come on, he'd start tapping right in tune. That's amazing, right? I guess we are all just evolved from chimpanzees. (laughs) Then someone said, you know, this might not be a great study because we've not changed the song at all. All we've taught him to do is beat at a certain time. So let's speed it up a little bit. And they sped it up, and it looked like, forgive me, 
but it looked like a white Baptist sitting in a black Pentecostal church. <laughs> that chimpanzee was doing great keeping time until they sped it up. Then, then he was just, just like, what are these people doing to me? It couldn't, he couldn't, couldn't do it. But human beings, I, I, I like to watch in choir practice. When we're trying to learn a new song, some of these songs have syncopation to them to where the parts are bouncing back and forth. I like to look down the aisle at all of the basses and tenors' feet when we get to one of those songs. And we all do it differently. For our part, I tap on the, the beat that I sing. And so if the bass are singing in alternate times, you look down there and half the feet are going up and the other half are going down. We're, 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 we're musical creatures, so, hey, teenagers, look right here. Young people, look right here. I've gone long. I know I have. I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. Listen to me. What you listen to will make you into somebody. The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That music you're listening to, it's making you think about something. That music you're listening to, it's making you feel something. It's either moral or immoral. What's it going to be? Music videos. Think about that. Music videos. If what I'm saying this morning is not true, then there should be no benefit to watching a music video compared to just listening to music. But every single person in here knows that when you couple the music with a dance with vibrant colors and exotic scenes, it affects you completely differently. Remember that the next time you sit down and turn on MTV. And hey, listen right here. Here's how our minds work. Once you watch that video, you can be going down the road and hear the song come on the radio and your mind will remember what you saw in that video. The morality of music. The morality of music. We have a very conservative music at our church for the most part. There's some who think we're too liberal. I can't, you can't find that balance. It doesn't matter anyway. I've talked with Brother Dowdy. I've, I've, I've told him I want, our, I want our music to be worshipful. I want, to, I want it to mean something. I've told our choir we're to be modest. We, we need to, our appearance, it must not take away from the music. People singing specials. The way you look, the way you behave is going to affect people. This is important in the church house, but let me remind you, you're here for at the most three hours a week, unless the preacher's long-winded, then maybe three and a half. But you're out there the rest of the week. And out there, you're not going to find someone who says, be careful what you wear because I don't want to affect you. Be careful what beat the music has because we don't want to have an effect on people. You won't find that out there you'll find a very subversive and deceptive motive behind everything you hear. So what are you hearing? What are you hearing? You can close your Bibles. Let's stand together, please. When we're singing congregational songs, there's many times the message of the song just means something to me. It could be the same song I sang last week and it didn't have that much of an effect on me, but maybe the Lord's caused something in my life to happen or it causes my mind to go somewhere while we're singing that song and it'll do something for me and I'll get moved. My heart will begin to feel a certain way. One of those songs for me is Be Still My Soul. The Lord is on your side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. I, I know what a little bit about carrying that, that cross of pain. I know a little bit about that. And so I hear that song, and boy, it's so comforting to know that my God knows what I might be carrying. It makes me feel a certain way, and then I begin to think about how comforting that is. Before long, I just want to raise my hands and say, Lord, thank you. Amen. That's not unique to Christians, by the way, because you watch any video, I hope you've never been to one, but watch any video from any concert, and you know what you find? People swaying, holding phones up. Sometimes there's crying. Because music 
moves us. The morality of music. What do you allow in your home? What's on your phone right now? Is it moral or immoral? How does it make you feel? What does it make you think about? And then what does it cause you to do? Here it is. Godly music gives you godly feelings that produce godly thoughts and move you into godly behavior. Immoral music, ungodly music, causes you to have ungodly feelings, ungodly thoughts, and will always encourage you towards ungodly behavior. Lord, thank you for your word. God, I've, I've done my best this morning. Now, Father, I pray that you would take what's been said, and Lord, would you apply it to our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would help us. Lord, as your word says, let, let your word dwell in us richly in all wisdom and teaching and admonishing. We admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. God, be glorified by the morality of our music. And then, Lord, I pray that you would do whatever is necessary to make corrections through conviction in the area of our lives where we're lacking. With your heads bowed.